Welcome, and now let's go have a look at Florence. Hopping off the train and pushing our baggage carts down the length of the train platform. It's generally about 200 yards to get from your train to the front of the station, where you might generally take a taxi to your hotel. And when we get to the main part of the station, we'll always get oriented, get together, and get our bearings and make the announcements. And in this case, we can walk to the hotel because it's only one block away. It's just right across the street from the train station, the Grand Hotel Baglioni, right in the heart of Florence. This is one of the grand institutions here in the city. This hotel is located right in the heart of the pedestrian district. So it's just about three blocks from the Duomo and about 10 blocks from practically any place in this small historic center. We get to the hotel and check in and get our instructions and orientation, go through the normal procedures of a hotel check-in, get your bags taken up to the room by the baggage porters, get your hotel keys, get instructions as to when we're gonna meet downstairs and go out for a little reconnoiter walk, but first you wanna go upstairs and have a look at your room. And in this case, it's a real treat for the senses in the Hotel Baglioni. The rooms are quite large compared to European standards, and you might have a view outside your window of an obelisk and an old church, Santa Maria Novella, will be going in there shortly on our walking tour. And the bathrooms are quite modern with that Italian sleek functionality. If you really want to save money on a European trip, you might consider a hotel that doesn't have bathrooms in the room, but this is what you're giving up. You're giving up a lot of comfort and convenience. When we travel through Europe with the Hawaii Geographic Society, we always use first-class hotels so we can really relax and enjoy ourselves. And we always have walking tours, so let me take you now on a walk through the heart of Florence. Okay, so how do you like the hotel? Fantastic spot, huh? Yeah, it's a great place. The Grand Hotel Baglioni, just about the best hotel in town. There's maybe five hotels in town that are of this quality, and we're in one of them and it's very much in the center. So from here we'll take a brief stroll and we'll be able to see many of the city highlights uh, just within a half an hour really. And what we'll do first is have a quick look at one of the important churches that's just across the street, another church. This one is Santa Maria Novella. And then we're gonna walk to the main square, the Piazza of the Domo, and uh, we'll take a look at the baptistery and. This is kind of a reconnaissance this afternoon. We're gonna go light on the history this afternoon. Tomorrow morning we'll have the local guide telling us more about the historical information. So today is more of an orientation, get your bearing, show you where the Ponte Vecchio is, the Arno, and some of the interesting side streets, point out some possible places for dinner, and then we'll take you back to the hotel or drop you off at a, a nice um, restaurant for dinner. There's several self-service cafeterias that have really excellent food and they should be open and it's uh, reasonable prices there too. So the whole thing might take about two hours, okay? Yep, for that. And again then tomorrow morning at 8.30 we'll meet here for the morning walk. Okay, so let's all stick together and we're gonna go across the street to Santa Maria Novella. Okay, so this is the uh, church of Santa Maria Novella. And you see here the facade, it's, um, as Kuhn just mentioned, all of a sudden it's quite different than what we've been seeing in Rome. It, it really is unique. It's a Florentine style of architecture designed by a uh, medieval architect of the name Alberti. Actually, the facade was put on a few hundred years after the church was built. The church was built in the uh, late 1300s and early 1400s. So it's a late Gothic church. Now the facade you see has uh, a very notable feature, the scroll on the upper right side and also on the upper left side. Now the scroll served several functions and in Rome actually there were churches with that kind of a feature you may have noticed. This church is the first place that that scroll was ever utilized. So this was where it was invented by the architect. And the function of it was to unite the upper portion of the facade with the lower portion in a graceful way, and also to hide the fact that the side of the church is lower. 
than the middle of the church. This the side is the aisle, and the middle is the nave. And so he was kind of masking that fact that the side is considerably smaller than the front. It's like a false front almost. When you look at it from the back, it's like Dodge City, an old western building. And the back is all plain brick. Only the facade here is marble. We'll go in in just one second, but first uh, notice the piazza here. This is the Piazza Santa Maria Novella. And it is truly a beautiful space. It's very peaceful and calm. Not much traffic here at all, just along the sides. And you'll notice some of the features, the two obelisks and the oval shape. That's because this used to be a racetrack hundreds of years ago. They'd race horses around here. And now nobody's racing anywhere, it looks like. They're just hanging out, real kickback. It's, it's a very international piazza at night. People who live in Florence from Africa and Asia and America, whatever, tend to hang out here. Real cosmopolitan gathering spot. And our hotel is just on the other side of these buildings. You know, we just came obviously from the hotel. So we're very close. You might take a stroll over here in the evening sometime just to have a look, see what's going on. Real pretty. And beyond you see a typical uh, a loggia. See the arcade with the pillars. We'll see several of those throughout Florence. It's typical of the Florentine Renaissance architecture with the open loggia. So let's have a look in Santa Maria Novella for just a few minutes. The interior is classic Gothic style. You see with the pointed arches, and it's quite a bit different than the highly decorated Baroque churches that we've been viewing in Rome. Uh, you might start thinking that this is a religious pilgrimage that you've been brought on with all these churches, but it's just the art, the architecture, the beauty, and, and the harmony of the places that everyone comes to admire, whether you're religious or not. You can really appreciate it. And if you are religious, you can get that much more out of it, I'm sure. You see the pointed arches, some of the hallmarks of that Gothic style of architecture. And the interior of churches in Florence is rather plain, like this. Um, there's several large paintings on the sides. There's one painting on the side in particular that we'll have a look at by Masaccio. And then we're going to go down to the altar and look at a very famous series of frescoes by Ghirlandaio. And then we'll be back outside on our way. Okay, so let's go look at Masaccio. Now, this painting looks like just another painting, but it is really quite special in the history of art because it's a, a very old painting and in particular, it was one of the first paintings that showed the use of perspective, of depth, and that great use of space. Now we take these things for granted, of course. But, you know, back in the Byzantine period, there was no perspective in the paintings. They were very flat, say back in, oh, the 800s, the 900s, and even in the Gothic period, painted space was very flat. Well, Masaccio, the painter here, is the early Renaissance, the earliest period of the Renaissance in, say, the early 1300s. And he painted the fresco right here on the wall. This is where it was created, and it's where it's been hanging ever since. And you see the obvious use of space with the crucifix just floating in space as a free form, and that forced perspective of lines and a vanishing point behind to really give it the contours. And then even in the faces of the people involved, you see the rounding of the nose and the cheeks and the folds of the garments. And here you have the uh, two people who are in front of the plane of the picture. These are the two donors who paid for the painting. So they got to get into the act too. And it creates that foreground and a midground and a background. And this is about the first time it ever happened in the history of Western painting. Now, in ancient times, back in the Roman days of BC, in Pompeii, the Romans actually did paint with some perspective. But that was lost after the fall of the Roman culture and the Roman Empire and the Dark Ages. It was totally lost. And the Renaissance was the rebirth, the rediscovery of some of these ancient classical techniques. Now, down here below is a warning for all of us. This is a skeleton. And he's saying something to you. And even here, there's some perspective. He's sitting on a ledge. And what he's saying in Latin, I've brushed him up on my Latin so I can tell you, translate. He's saying, what you are now, I once was. 
what I am now, you will become. A nice thought for the church to keep in mind here. They want to keep people in line. So let's go look at the masterpiece of Ghirlandaio. So here we are uh, behind the high altar, and this chapel was painted by Ghirlandaio in the fresco style, which means painting on wet plaster. And it was painted in the late, it was painted in the late 1400s. So it's been here for 500 years with these beautiful, vibrant colors still perfectly preserved, pretty much the way he painted it back 500 years ago. Now, it's really notable for several reasons. First of all, it's inherent beauty. It, it's just enjoyable to look at it. It's colorful, there's motion, there's so much going on. It's almost like uh, an illustrated history of Florence because it depicts a slice of life of Florence at that time in the late 1400s. This is how people dressed. This is what their buildings looked like. This is what their beds looked like. This is how they poured water. This is what the streets were like. You look up to the second layer and you can see a beautiful street scene going way off into the background with a really sophisticated kind of perspective. And you see little benches on the buildings. Well, this is where people would sit. And even today, we'll see those same buildings with the stone benches at the, street, at the street level. Now, it depicts some religious scenes, of course. It's scenes from the life of the Virgin in particular, the, the birth, the presentation of the Virgin, and some other types of religious scenes, which is part of its importance. But the other is just the, the secular value of seeing the clothing and just seeing the beauty. Another real interesting aspect of this chapel is this is where Michelangelo began to learn how to paint. Michelangelo was apprenticed to Ghirlandaio. Uh, Michelangelo grew up in a village of just a short distance from Florence. And when he was in his teens, he came to Florence to work in the workshops of the masters. And the first master that he worked with was Ghirlandaio. He didn't do any of the actual painting himself. He was probably helping mix the paints and fill in some of the blanks maybe. But uh, this is where he helped, he helped uh, Michelangelo learn how to paint. Uh, Michelangelo quickly took off on his own. He didn't need any help. <laughs> he taught himself pretty quickly and then began teaching the world. But this is one place where he got started. And so let's head on out and take a look at Florence. We're now in the main piazza of the Duomo. Obviously the great cathedral of the Duomo. And uh, the facade that you see is actually relatively recent. It's 19th century. The church itself is late Gothic and early Renaissance. So it's 13th century, 14th century in the interior. And we'll go inside and have a look. And then we'll come back out and have a look over at the baptistery briefly. And then we're going to walk down the main street, the main shopping street, which is just that away. And there's no cars in the center here. So it's a lot more peaceful once we're into the center. OK, so let's have a. A little walk inside and I'll tell you a little bit about it in there. This cathedral is one of the largest churches in Italy. It's, it's actually the, in the top three in Italy. There's St. Peter's, there's the cathedral in Milan, and there's this cathedral. Uh, and it's just a magnificent sight. You can see the Gothic arches. It's that old built in the Gothic period. And it's plain on the inside, really. You look at the walls, and they're largely undecorated. Even the windows up top, they're not even stained glass windows. It's transparent glass. And that was intentional. It was uh, their way of allowing the spirit of the Lord to come in in an easier way. At least that was the tradition here in Florence. And we also find stained glass windows down in the lower levels. But not a lot of windows. You see, the walls are mostly stone. Um, unlike some of the Gothic cathedrals in northern Europe, where the windows pretty much filled most of the walls with the Gothic style of structure, as we'll see in Paris at Notre Dame. And yet the church is so big that light does flood in. And now your eyes are adjusting a little bit more to the darkness, and it does seem a little bit brighter. So now let's walk over to the central part so we can see down the nave. 
Now you see the, uh, the pillars, these huge, massive Gothic pillars that hold up the roof. And there's a little bit of, a, of an illusion here created by the architect. Uh, the pillars actually get a little bit closer together towards the center as you go down the nave of the church. And this creates more of a feeling of size and spaciousness and enhances the overall drama of the cathedral. Let's go have a look at the city from ground level. So we'll walk down here to the Piazza del Signoria. This is the, uh, one of the main crossroads of medieval Florence and Renaissance Florence, and even today, it's a very lively crossroads. You see to your right, this big triumphal arch. This is the Piazza della Repubblica, constructed largely in the 19th century. And there's some cafes around there. Gili's is one of them. You might go there later, have a coffee. But if you sit down, it's very expensive. Stand up, it's 80 cents. And this way, look at this narrow, bustling street. This is the Corso, eh? Sound familiar? Yes. The Corso. This is Florence's version of our main street in Rome. So it was one of their most central streets, ancient Roman road, actually, originally. And a fun place to stroll, as I said, for blocks and blocks on both sides. It's great for exploring. We're going to go another couple blocks. I'll show you the cafeteria. It doesn't look like much, the hot pot. But uh, this is one of the best deals in town for good food. Uh, there's half a dozen self-service cafeterias in the center of Florence, so you can take your pick. There's one just on the other side of the Duomo that's pretty good. There's one on Via Calzaioli that's okay, be fine. And like at lunchtime, you can get a tray full of food for $12. At dinner, it's probably about the same, maybe $15. And it's self-service. You just, as you can see, go right up to the cafeteria line, and you can see exactly what they've got in all the hot tables there. It's all fresh and it's terrific food. And you know, in another, whatever, 30, 40 minutes when we're done with the Ponte Vecchio and such, uh, I'll take you back in this direction and if you would just want to eat then, terrific. You know, you can eat and then you just walk home on your own, just right down there to the Duomo and take a left. So get your appetite in gear and we'll be back here shortly. Right behind you, you have a nice uh, facade backdrop while you're eating if you get one of the outside tables. This is the church of Orson Michel, right here. And this is the oldest of the major churches in Florence. It's early Gothic. It dates back to 11th century and 12th century. And you might pop in here in the daytime if you're on the street shopping. It closes at five, so it's not open right now. It's very dark in the interior, but it's uh, really worth having a look at. Even the statues outside, Several of them were carved by Giotto and some of the other great Renaissance sculptors. But the church itself, or San Michel, is early Gothic. Next, we're going to look at the Piazza del Signoria and the Straw Market. OK, so we're now in the Piazza della Signoria, probably the most important square in all of Florence. It's the political center, it's the government center, it's the police center. The structure that you see here is the Palazzo Vecchio, the old palace. And it was the seat of power for, gosh, five, six hundred years here in Florence. It's built in a real rough defensive style with that proud tower thrusting its presence up into the sky, showing how important and powerful this place really is. The architecture speaks for itself. And tomorrow we'll have a look inside the courtyard. It is actually also a museum. This is one of the main museums in the city that you might want to go in to see on, on your own later, um, either tomorrow afternoon or the next morning. We'll have a little time the next morning. And speaking of museums, the Uffizi, is the museum in northern Italy, and it has the finest collection of the Italian Renaissance any place in the world. And it's right here, just right there. The building just to the right of the Palazzo Vecchio is the Uffizi Gallery. 
There's cafes you might check out. They're pretty expensive, but if you stand at the bar and drink some coffee or beer, it's a lot cheaper. Now we're going to look at the Stroh Market, which is a fun place for shopping, and then the Ponte Vecchio, and that pretty much completes our overview, and then I'll take you back in this direction, down here. Okay. So here we are at the Straw Market. Uh, it's called that because they used to sell straw items, baskets and hats and whatnot, and now they sell everything in here. And it's a fun place for shopping, for souvenirs and oh, somewhat for leather goods, but you'd be probably a little better off waiting until you go to the leather district, which we'll show you tomorrow morning for leather goods. Uh, some real good shops a few blocks that way. But here is fun, they've got souvenirs, scarves, handbags, cheap little leather goods maybe to give to your friends and whatever. This has been an open marketplace for 500 years. See the Gothic arches? And it's still functioning today as it has been for all that time. It's a remarkable spot. Now another fun, cheap and delicious way to eat in Florence is at the pizzerias. It's a little different than that thin crusty pizza in Rome. A little thicker, more toppings, more delicious really. And our favorite pizzeria in the city is right here. They have got all kinds of exotic vegetable toppings on the pizzas in there. It's just a wonderful spot. My wife, who's a gourmet vegetarian, swears by this place. It's just her favorite spot. And we already got some customers. <laughs> oh, they're hungry. Hungry campers here. And again, this is easy to find. This is the Ponte Vecchio. Well, you see where all those people are at? It looks like a street, but that's it. That's the bridge, the Ponte Vecchio. So just before the Ponte Vecchio, a couple blocks, Pizzeria Piccadilly. They even have a little garden out in the back. You can sit down if you want, or you can take the pizza to go and bring it down to the banks of the Arno. I'll show you where, and have a little picnic with the view of the Ponte Vecchio. Let's have a look. This is just to give you a quick peek at the Ponte Vecchio to show you, instead of walking across it, it looks like a street when you walk across it, but from here you can see, no, this is a bridge crossing the Arno River. And a magnificent bridge it is. It's been here for 400 years. It's one of the first bridges anywhere in Europe that had buildings on it. There's one in the town of Bath in England, and there's one somewhere else, and there's this one here in Florence. Ponte Vecchio means old bridge. And it's most famous for the gold jewelry. You can spend lots of money on this old bridge. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's the Arno River. 